This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Cosmos. Cosmos is building the Internet of Blockchains, an ecosystem where thousands of blockchains can interoperate, creating the foundation for a new token economy. If you have an idea for a dApp, visit cosmos.network slash epicenter to learn more and to get in touch with the Cosmos team. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Cuchillo, and I'm here today with Sunny Agarwal and Meher Roy. Hi, guys. Hey, how are you doing? Hello. I'm doing well. Uh, I, I guess you guys just had a really interesting interview with uh, the guys from Bolt Labs. Yeah. Yes. It started out as the guys, but it ended up that one of the guests dropped out. And so we talked mostly with Ayo, Ayo who is the CEO of Bolt Labs. Initially, the interview was supposed to be with Ayo Akinyele and Matthew Green, but Matthew had some technical issues, and so we lost his recording. So unfortunately, we had to cut out his parts, which you'll notice a little bit in the beginning, but the rest is barely noticeable. So let's get a high-level overview of this project. Like, Why did you guys want to do an interview with Bolt, and why did you find it interesting? I kind of knew about the Bolt project. You know, It seemed interesting to me, and I met uh, Ayo actually again at ZCon in Croatia when I was there and that kind of reminded me that oh I should like float these guys back up to the top of our list because it was interesting and so you know I guess what got me interested was in summary it's a heavily privacy preserving uh, payment channel solution and potentially it, it can be even integrated with Lightning and it takes a very hub and spoke architecture or kind of assumes almost hub and spoke and it to me what I what got me interested in it was it seems to except that like in Lightning, you're going to have this like high amount of centralization. And this is something a lot of critics often say that Lightning is just going to like devolve into hubs and those hubs are just going to be like Visa and whatnot. And then they can just censor payments, whatever they want. What's interesting here is that if you have privacy at the payment channel network layer, then even if you have this hub and spoke architecture, it's kind of still difficult for these hubs to censor people. And so to me, it, it kind of, help solve a lot of the censorship issues with Lightning, in my opinion. For me, I just felt it's cool technology. And I was curious if they have a nice business model. Did they have a nice business model? I wasn't very satisfied with their business model questions. I wish there was a better conception of it. But then Sunny pointed out to me that you could say the same about 90% of blockchain companies. <laughs> Right. I mean, I don't think their business model seems fundamentally that different than like Lightning Labs, for example. Like what is Lightning Labs' business model as well? I don't know, but these companies should have a business model. <laughs> I mean, if you're building a technology for three years, you're building it without a business model. That must be a bold bet to make. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of companies in the space probably have, that have been around for a while still don't have a clear idea of what the business model will be, but it's... Number it, go up? Number go up is a is a business model. Yeah, yeah. I think it's it's Lasse from One KX who says uh, he he came to me once and said a token is better than having a business model <laughs> or something like that. And that's basically kind of his thesis. Which yeah. And my thesis is that the market is going to ask business models from tokens. Ah, that's an interesting thesis. Could you expand on that? I think in the future, um, not today. But we are going to jump off the cliff and there's going to be a massive bear market. And in that massive bear market, most networks are going to die. Most networks are going to die. The only ones that survive, the only tokens that survive will be those which, in which you have a network that, that's fundamentally making revenue by offering some interesting product. And the revenue it makes basically will go to the token holders which is what will prop up the value of the token and make it an attractive thing to hold. So let me give you an example, like a decentralized exchange. Think of like Binance DEX. A decentralized exchange can charge trading fees. So you can have a network like Binance DEX with this internal token BNB that's charging trading fees for activity happening on, on, on their network. The aggregate collection of trading fees is the revenue of that network. And that is allocated to the BNB token holders. So you, you see already there are networks with incipient business models. There are business models in the stablecoin space, the, the, those in decentralized exchange space. What hasn't happened yet is we just haven't had a winter strong enough to make that the default. That, that's a great point. 
I increasingly am looking at projects in the space and looking at the the products that are coming out of the space and thinking, okay, what is the sustainable business here that will enable this product to sort of move beyond the hype of crypto? And as of yet, I have seen very, very few of those. I think like there's a couple of examples, but I mean, this is something all three of us have been sort of talking about off the air a lot, and, but it, it's, it mostly comes down to like, what are the use cases here beyond speculation? But yeah, this kind of goes beyond, I guess, the, the content of this interview. But maybe it's something we should come back to at some point on the show and like do an episode about, about this very thing. So before we get to the interview, I'm going to tell Leaf Blockchain Week, attending Scaling Bitcoin on the 11th and 12th of September, Ethereal on the 15th, and Starkware Sessions on the 16th. We've actually partnered with Starkware Sessions and Epicenter listeners can get 20% off the regular ticket price with the code Epicenter. So just go to epicenter.rocks slash Starkware. That's S-T-A-R-K. W-A-R-E to register for that event. It's going to be absolutely terrific. On Wednesday evening on the 11th from 6 to 9 p.m. at the Samsung Next office, there's a Chain of Eve event. It's a panel about the era of new and rising chains and assets. It's presented by the folks at Zengo Wallet, if you know about them. They're a great keyless blockchain wallet, and it's moderated by their CEO, Oriel Ohayan. And speaking on the panel will be Zaki Mannion of Cosmos and Tenement, Mason Borda of Tokensoft and me. And you can register for that event at zengo.rocks slash meetup. Come hang out with us there as well. We're initially going to do a drinks meetup on the 16th, but it looks like very few people are registering. So I think we're going to have to cancel it. But I'll be in Tel Aviv for about 10 days. So you know, if you want to hang out in more ad hoc ways, you can reach out to me on Twitter or Telegram or uh, look for our uh, Epicenter Telegram group. Uh, it's Epicenter Podcast. So t.me slash Epicenter Podcast. And Sonny, you're going to be in Amsterdam soon, right? Yep. Uh, there's a interesting meetup uh, that happens every month in Amsterdam. Like I think it's been going on for years and years called Bitcoin Wednesdays. It's been going on for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's first Wednesday of every month. And so uh, September 4th, I'll be there giving a talk on Cosmos and Interchain and all, all sorts of uh, interesting stuff there. Cool. So basically, just as this episode drops, uh, you'll be in Amsterdam doing a meetup there. And where can people register for that? You can look for the uh, Bitcoin uh, Wednesdays meetup uh, page. It's on meetup.com and you can register right there. Great. Uh, I wish I could be there, but uh, unfortunately I'm not. But yeah, I mean, I've been wanting to go to Bitcoin Wednesdays for for years and years and years, but never am in Amsterdam on the first Wednesday of the month. (laughs) Yeah. This is my first time in Amsterdam. This is my first time going to Amsterdam. Uh, Richard, he's been like trying to get me to come to one of these for a while. And so this is the first time I've been in Europe on the first Wednesday of a month. So I'm like, all right, fine. I'll make the trip out to Amsterdam. Cool. So with that, here's your interview with A.U. Akinyele of Boat Labs. Hi. Today we are interviewing Ayo, who are working on Bolt Labs. Very interesting privacy preserving off-chain payments protocol. At first, I, I was really skeptical, uh, just as much as Matt. And I went the other direction. Uh, I worked on like, you know, just traditional crypto problems, you know, with respect to like data security. And so we had worked on a project called um, OpenABE uh, slash the, the Zutro Toolkit, um, which is a uh, attribute-based encryption library uh, for, you know, protecting all kinds of data in uh, different settings, uh, implementing role-based access control as well as content-based access control. And so I did that for quite some time. And then uh, in about, about 2015, you know, I got an introduction to uh, some of the Bitcoin core developers. They had a problem uh, in the sense that, you know, they had this uh, constant time uh, AES library that they wanted to um, do an audit for. Um, and so they wanted to basically prove that it was, it was basically correct and it was free from, you know, uh, any side channel attacks. And so I leveraged some of uh, the things that I learned academically uh, with respect to formal verification uh, and uh, basically proved that like their uh, uh, instantiation was, you know, correct and free from side channel attacks. And so I used some of the tools from Galois um, called the Software uh, Analysis Workbench uh, or SAW. And, and so this was like my first foray into working with cryptocurrency projects. That wasn't my only project, uh, but like uh, that was the first. And so later on uh, in like 2000, I uh, work with the Handshake Project, uh, along with Matt and, and one of our other co-founders, uh, Colleen Swanson. And, you know, we help them with their audit as, uh, auditing their 
uh, design prior to their initial launch. Um, and so I was like entering the space, you know, from that perspective and, and looking at the fact that all of this cryptography was getting deployed um, and how do I, you know, leverage my, um, you know, experience and expertise uh, to, to help. Um, and so I didn't really get the itch until uh, Matt and Ian uh, approached me about their work on Bolt uh, and, and their paper. I read it. I was, I fell in love um, with the, with the vision and with the, the ability to um, realize a, you know, a, a simple um, way to achieve privacy without you know, having to do things like ZK snarks. And so the fact that it was off chain um, and it was a quite an efficient solution uh, that they pr proposed. Um, and, you know, I, I basically switched over, <laughs> I should, uh, I should say, um, and, and worked on, on Bolt full time. So you ended up establishing a company, Bolt Labs, and you're, you're CEO of Bolt Labs. And give us a sense of where Bolt Labs is at, how big is the team, and what kind of products you're trying to ship based off the technology. Great question. So uh, it's currently six of us. Uh, we've been basically heads down uh, building the, the core uh, Bolt protocol. About five uh, cryptographic engineers. Um, and then we have one um, lightning engineer that, that is joining us uh, September 1st coming out of UC Berkeley. And so, you know, it's, we're, we're still in the early stages, uh, but the, the goal is to uh, build, you know, wallets and, you know, end user products that you know, ease the friction of using uh, Lightning um, with uh, privacy uh, as an option or privacy by default for, you know, both trading and, and payment use cases. And so we've, you know, we've specced out some paper prototypes of what that could look like. We've showed some people we're kind of refining it, but like we're at the stage where the focus really is on the core protocol, but understanding, you know, the users that we're trying to reach um, and building, you know, products that that address their pain points. And, you know, it's really a process. We're trying not to make any assumptions on, on where those users are um, and which chains that they're using. Um, and so Zcash is our, you know, starting point uh, that we're using for our reference implementation because it gives us the best uh, privacy properties at layer one. But our techniques are uh, generally applicable to other chains, and I'm sure we're we're, we're going to dig into that, um, you know, during this uh, podcast. So, just curious, who is the uh, who is the uh, Lightning engineer from UC Berkeley? Uh, Darius Parvin. He uh, worked. He built the uh, Lightning Channel Optimizer, which is a. Uh, I don't know if you know him. No, I actually don't. I know, I know a lot of the people at Berkeley because uh, I was there. But yeah, yeah. So he came out of the the neuroscience department. He is not a, a traditional you know, CS uh, major, but he's he's dived into to cryptocurrency. He's a Bitcoin enthusiast, um, and I met him actually through the Insight SF program. Um, and you know, we've we've clicked. I don't know if you're familiar with that, uh, but it's uh, it's something that allows you know people that aren't you know traditional CS or you know aren't crypto or blockchain engineers you know to transition into the the, to the industry and uh, gain some experience, uh, work on projects. Um, that actually have real world uses. And so the thing that he did was, you know, uh, observe that like, you know, when you join the Lightning Network, the, the very first question is, who do I open a channel with? And it's always based on what your purpose is on the Lightning Network, you know, whether it's a business um, user versus just a casual, you know, trying to send money to friends and family. Um, and so trying to, um, his idea was really producing a service that made that easy for um, the average user. And so, you know, based on how this uh, space is evolving, you know, a lot of services that provide utility and, you know, simplifies the, the user experience for, um, you know, the average user end up getting used more um, and, you know, end up having a, a bigger opportunity to, to monetize. And so I liked, you know, that, that project a lot. And I thought, you know, it would be a good addition for us um, as we kind of make this transition from uh, building the core protocol into thinking about, you know, what are the right services to uh, launch um, with Bolt? We are already referencing Lightning uh, a ton. So maybe to just to frame, frame Bolt, why don't we get into how Lightning works roughly and what are the privacy features of Lightning by default? Yeah, so the, the basic idea, you know, for Lightning is that like you're opening a channel um, and you're funding it with, with, with some Bitcoin, right? So you lock up uh, some amount of Bitcoin. And you want to amortize the cost of, of making payments from that channel, you know, over a period of time. And so the thing that we focus on is the fact that when you're making payments on that channel, once you've opened it, 
it's always the state is managed in a symmetric fashion. So both sides get the same record of uh, transactions on the channel. And you're literally just exchanging signatures on state updates uh, for the channel. Um, and so these are standard uh, signatures that get you know, formed into uh, transactions that get broadcasted uh, when you want to close the channel. And so at any point in time of that channel, you can you know, you know, close and the most recent uh, state gets broadcasted and you know, the users get paid out what their uh, current balances are. And so this is the, the, the basic setup. And of course, this is great because you know, you're uh, essentially minimizing you know, the fees. You're, you're getting instant finality um, and you're able to use it for all kinds of purposes. So if, if you extend this out into a network, you can pay anyone on that has an open channel with someone that you uh, are connected with um, and you don't have to open a, a direct channel with that individual. And so you could essentially have a channel open for a really long period of time and use it for everything you could imagine. And I think that's the, the real value of, of Lightning in the sense that, you know, it, it offers a way to scale um, while, you know, freeing up the, the blockchain in terms of the, the transactions that are now not recorded on the blockchain. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Cosmos, the internet of blockchains. Cosmos is live and we couldn't be more excited to see so many projects already building on it. Blockchain technologies are evolving fast and development shouldn't be one size fits all. As a dApp developer, you need the tools that will allow your dApp to scale, grow, and evolve over time. The Cosmos SDK is a user-friendly modular framework which allows you to customize your dApp to best suit your needs. It's powered by Tenement Core, an advanced implementation of the BFT proof of stake protocol. Cosmos takes care of networking and consensus and allows you to focus on building your application in your language of choice. Ethereum smart contracts will be supported soon, and the SDK makes it simple for you to connect to other blockchains in the Cosmos network. If you have an idea for a dApp and would like to learn more about the Cosmos SDK, or if you'd like to connect your existing dApp to Cosmos, visit cosmos.network epicenter. For Epicenter listeners, the Cosmos team will reach out to answer your questions and help you get started. We'd like to thank Cosmos for their support of Epicenter. So when I create a payment channel, I mean, from the privacy standpoint, so, you know, we're, we are able to basically, you know, we only have to, we don't have to broadcast to the entire world what our individual channel updates are, but basically we have, we still have to broadcast to the world what our net uh, balances at the end of the day were. And so the goal here is you're trying to somehow make it so I don't even have to broadcast that portion as well, right? Right. That, that's where um, using Zcash comes into play in that, like, we don't want the opening of the channel um, and the uh, final splitting of funds of the channel uh, when you close it uh, to be leaked to the network. And so we tried, we fund the, the channel from the shielded pool. Um, and that allows, you know, not only, you know, hiding, you know, the, the balances of the channel from the network, but also removes the linkability from channels made off chain with the on chain identity. And so like in the middle of a payment, let's say the, your counterparty aborts, they shouldn't be able to identify who you are on chain if we use, you know, Zcash and, and Bolt. So why does this need any sort of special payment channels? For example, let's say, you know, today the shielded uh, Z addresses don't have uh, Bitcoin script or something similar, but let's say they do. Why, what stop, why can't we just use the standard, a standard payment channel implementation and just have them always output to a Z address. Why do we need a special construction on the channel implementation rather than just a using Z addresses with normal payment channels? That is a great question. So, uh, so there's two two parts to that. So on the on the payment channel side, the state is symmetric and, and lightning, and so Bolt is different in that it it, it breaks that symmetry. Um, now, one side maintains um, what we effectively call commitments to the state of the channel. And it's proving in zero knowledge, you know, um, each uh, state transition. And it's proving that, you know, it has a previous signature on the previous state of the channel that the new commitment to uh, like the updated balance and the previous uh, commitment on that channel are different by some amount. And then, you know, a range proof that there's a sufficient balance in the channel for the payment to go through. And so these are the three ingredients that are proved with each state transition. Um, and the, the main property that it provides is just the linkability between, you know, the payments and the identity of the user initiating that payment. Now, for Zcash, you know, the, 
you could obviously uh, th things have gotten efficient uh, in terms of the the, the Z to Z uh, or shielded to shielded payments, um, but the transactions are larger, and so you know Bolt is a, is is definitely going to uh, cut down on uh, or using Bolt would would cut down on you know how much the storage overhead, right? Because you're just you only have two transactions, you know, for opening and closing, um, which would be shielded, and then all of the intermediate updates, you know, are not recorded on chain. And so, from a user perspective, their storage requirements now go down as a result of using Bolt. For the the use cases of like using the channel for all kinds of stuff, you know, the instant finality that they get means that it's more usable. Um, and the fees are still going to be low in, in either scenario, um, just because of uh, how uh, Zcash kind of by default does like 0 0.001 for all um, shielded uh, transactions. But uh, does that ad address the question I think you were um, asking? What does that look like in the real world? Why would I want the state between uh, of a channel to not be symmetric? What's a case where I don't want the counterparty it seems that normally when we're trying to do financial transactions, the goal is to maintain privacy from third-party observers. What is the goal here of trying to maintain privacy against my counterparty in the channel itself? The basic construct, you know, gives us this asymmetry. But when you kind of expand this out to an intermediary, which is really the, the real um, use case here, um, is that like the only thing that they learn is that fees were paid as a result of routing um, that payment. And so they don't know the amount. They don't know uh, who the individuals are. Um, again, they can't link you know, the, the identity to the payment. Um, and so this unlinkability gives us you know, essentially privacy from the, the third party. That's very interesting. So I can essentially pay Sunny off chain. So, uh, so Sunny and I are connected with the channel. And I can pay Sunny multiple times and none of this data hits the chain. If, if Sunny has a lot of channels open with a lot of different people, Sunny just knows that it received a payment from one of these channels, but it does not know which channel the payment came from. So now if like Sunny is my friend, maybe, maybe that has less utility because like when I'm paying my friend, my friend knows that the payment came from, from me. But there might be cases where Sunny is not my friend, like Sunny is like just a payment processor and I am sending a payment to IO and Sunny is just a payment processor in the middle. I have a channel with Sunny and Sunny has a channel with IO. In that case, the way Bolt will generalize is that I'll send Sunny some information and Sunny will send IO some information, but it will not, IO will receive a payment. IO won't know where the payment came from and Sunny won't know where the payment came from. Both of these parties will know their payment just came from somewhere and the quantity of that payment. Right? Like is, is, is that the kind of privacy model Bolt is going after? Yes, yeah. Uh, and, you know, like Matt said, I mean, the, the use cases really, I think, will determine where uh, people use it. And so, like, applications that, uh, that I've been even thinking about are along the right directions of micropayments for ads. Uh, obviously, you know, that, that is a, a small market right now in terms of the privacy preserving aspect of it. Um, so I know Brave is, is, uh, is building a browser that has native support for this. But in general, you know, you know there are a lot of um, use cases in uh, being able to you know, find users that care about that as part of the, the journey. Um, and so it, it is our responsibility to, to make it as usable as possible um, and, and hiding the complexities that, that go along with uh, not only payment channels, but when you add you know, privacy you know, on top of that. In the sense that, like, there are you know services that that we think would would make things much easier for users to jump in. So, in the bold scenario, when I'm I'm paying IO via Sunny, I am not leaking my cryptocurrency address. I am not leaking to the public the amount that I have I have paid, and I'm not even leaking the initial balance of the channels I have I have opened. Like, none of these things get get leaked. Just to correct one thing, uh, so the, the initial balances of the channel are uh, revealed to your counterparty when you establish, but it's really just a, like a bootstrapping uh, type of thing. And the counterparty needs to know that the funding transaction for that channel matches the off-chain uh, commitment that you've established. And so that part of it is not necessarily hidden from your counterparty. We do want that to be hidden from the, the network. 
Um, and so that's where, you know, the shielded features of Zcash comes into play. Uh, but because programmability is not where it needs to be uh, for, you know, shielded outputs, we can't fully do that yet. But like the the ideal solution would be end to end, you know, the balances for the channel would be, you know, private from the network. And so that's ultimately what we're trying to get to. So how does routing in this case work? Because, you know, when you're routing in Lightning, you you kind of want to know how much flow capacity uh, different paths have so that way you can figure out what route to use. If I can't, you know, no one's publicizing what their flow capacity is, how do I figure out what route to use for my uh, payments? That is a great question. Um, I think for now, we've been focusing really on the on the single hop solution um, because of the the network aspects of it. So like, you know, Lightning already deploys onion routing for longer paths, which, which works, uh, except for the issue of collusion, you know, like between the first hop and the last hop on the path. Um, and so we've been thinking about Bold as like, just as a starting point, um, you know, using it, using Bolt to break the, the linkability between the first and, and last path to prevent, you know, collusion um, and like just use onion routing in the middle. And so obviously the, the amounts get leaked to the, the nodes in the middle, but first and last hop don't know, you know, the, what those amounts will be into, into who the identity of, of the end user. And so it's really a complementary um, type of thing that we're, we're, head, uh, we're after right now uh, between Bolt and, um, the onion routing um, that that Lightning provides, um, and then you know the goal is to try to improve on that. You know once we've um, deployed you know that you know basic solution, but it's it's a multi-step um, long process. You know to essentially build uh, an end-to-end uh, solution for Lightning. Um, so Bolt just focuses on one one hop for now. Let's get into how Bolt works. Maybe maybe we can start with the simplest case. The simplest case is simply like a bi-directional channel. Me opening a channel with, with Sunny and us being able to move value across it. So for, for a simple case, how does the underlying technology work and what kind of cryptography is being used under the hood? Yeah, so that's a, another great question. So there are three basic uh, primitives that we've been using for the first version, I would say. Um, so it's, uh, you know, blind signatures, which... Um, have a long history. Uh, it's a way to getting a counterparty to sign a message without them actually seeing the contents of that message. The first time I, you know, uh, read about it, it kind of blew my mind. Like, what? That doesn't make sense. But you know, it, it's something that that has been, you know, in, in cryptography for decades. Um, and and so so that's the first primitive. The second is um, you know commitments and then uh, zero knowledge proofs. Um, and so when you blend all three together, um, what you essentially get is the ability to commit to a wallet, which basically has a, a unique identifier, which essentially represents that state of, of, of the channel and the balances of the, the customer and the merchant, and then an identifier for the channel. And so this wallet essentially is the thing that is used to produce you know, the, the transactions that close the channel and give each person the amount that they, um, the, you know, the most recent, you know, balance of the channel. And so for each wallet, we essentially, you know, commit and then reveal just the identifier. So the, the thing that, that uniquely represents that wallet. And then we prove that, like, we have a signature on the previous state of the channel. And finally, a range proof that the, the channel has sufficient balance, you know, for the payment. Um, and so the commitment um, is used to produce the proof. And the once the the counterparty or the merchant has you know acknowledged and verified this proof, they take that commitment and use it to produce a a signature on the next up, uh, state of the channel um, using the a blind signature protocol. And so the commitment represents really an encryption of the wallet that the counterparty turns into a signature that allows the the customer to get their money back without them having to see the wallet. And so. All of that to say that, like, the zero knowledge proof comes into play, you know, when the customer wants to essentially make a payment. And so that's, that's when they prove all of the things that has happened on the last uh, version of, of that channel. Um, and so once they've convinced the counterparty, you know, that they are a valid customer, that they have an open channel with at some point in time, then that's when the, the counterparty can produce essentially a new you know, blind signature on the new version of the channel. 
So you do this over and over again with each payment. And so I'm, I'm missing one other part. So the, the second phase of the, of the payment is revoking the previous state. And so it's like a commit, reveal, and then revoke type of flow. Um, and so the revocation is also similar to what happens in, in Lightning, um, so that like the, the counterparty can catch the, the customer from double spending a previous state of the channel. And so it, it's really a fair exchange of, of signatures in which one side is able to get a, a signature that allows them to get their money back safely, and then they revoke the, the previous state of the channel. And so you just kind of do this, this song and dance um, with each payment. So it's like two rounds where the first round is what allows the customer to always be able to get their money back. And so if that fails, uh, if that initial part of the payment fails, then the only recourse that your customer has is to essentially uh, broadcast the previous uh, state that they have a signature for um, to, to close out the channel. And so hopefully this is, this is making uh, sense, but it's really just these two, two phases of getting a, a signature on a, a new version of the wallet that gives me my money back and then revoking the previous state of the channel. So kind of, I guess, in summarization, what, you know, what the Zero Knowledge Proof is doing here is the Zero Knowledge Proof is saying, hey, I know of a payment channel state that I've had in the past with you, that this is a valid updated state with this differential in payment, uh, but I don't have to tell you which payment channel it was for. And like, I see that this allows the sender to close the channel whenever they want. In a payment channel, you also want the receiver to also be able to close whenever possible. How do, in this situation, how does the receiver close if he doesn't know the actual end payment state? Yeah, so we had to make a trade-off um, in that, like, because the, the counterparty doesn't know the current balance of the channel and therefore can't initiate closure, um, we basically give them, during the, the channel establishment phase, when, you know, funds get escrowed um, and get broadcast to the network, uh, we give them a transaction that allows them to close and pays them the full channel balance. And so this is kind of like a collateral, right? And so there's a dispute period that, you know, once this this transaction, which we call a shadow funding transaction, because it, it doesn't have any information other than like, I get everything in the channel. Um, and so you, once the customer sees that transaction, um, they can essentially correct that state by posting their own closing transaction, um, which has the correct uh, balances of the channel. In that path, um, the, the counterparty could, you know, essentially dispute that closing transaction if, like, it somehow represented the wrong state, right? Or if it was a double a spend attempt. And so, you know, because of this asymmetry, there's an extra transaction that now has to be broadcasted than if it was just uh, the customer or if it was a mutual uh, close. And I think this is okay uh, for at least the, the use cases that we think, you know, users would, would want to use this for. So, so what you're doing is basically, you know, it's forcing the uh, sender to uh, settle because the recipient says, I'm going to try to steal all the money. And now you're forced to try to uh, submit the best state that you know of. So in Lightning, you know, they punish people for submitting old states. So we don't do that here in Bolt because we're depending on the ability to submit old states to force closing. We, we don't punish people for that. Well, so I mean, indirectly we are. Um, like, for example, if the customer does broadcast the old state of the channel, I mean, we still have a revocation path that is similar to what Lightning does you know, for punishing uh, that. And, and the counterparty could claim those funds because of the revocation. We call it a revocation token that uh, the customer gives the merchant. And so this revocation token is basically uh, something that the, the counterparty would use to uh, claim all of the funds for any. Uh, old state that the customer could broadcast. So you mentioned that first we, uh, I, I send a proof saying that this is the new state. And then after that, we uh, kind of, I also send a revocation like saying, okay, I deny, you know, I promise to not broadcast this old state. Why is this process not atomic? What happens if, for example, I, I do the payment send, but then I don't actually send a revocation. And that, that seems okay for one way channels, but how do we solve this for like, especially two-way channels? So it, it is atomic, actually. So, it's, um, so the, the first phase is really proof allows the, the customer to convince the, the counterparty or the merchant that you know, they are someone that they've had an open channel with. And, and so the only thing that they're doing is just revealing the identifier for the previous state. They haven't revoked it, but they've re revealed it. 
And, and so by revealing it, the merchant you know, then issue what we call effectively a, a closing signature. Um, and that closing signature is really the, the thing that gives the customer safety. And so without that, you know, they can't get their money back for the new that reflects the fact that they made this, this recent payment. But this doesn't obviously protect the, the merchant, right? They still need uh, assurance that the previous date will be revoked. But the fact that like they've revealed in that first phase allows them to, you know, detect you know, if, you know, the customer broadcast that previous date. Um, and so the revoke uh, step after would give them the signature to claim all of the funds um, from the previous date, if that was ever broadcasted. The asymmetry in the state, how does this work when we start moving towards uh, bi-directional channels? Like the asymmetry in state seems to make sense to me if we're doing one person's always paying and one person's always receiving. Doesn't the other person also need the state so then they can send a payment in the other direction? Or even in the bi-directional case, is there still the situation where there's like one person is the master of the state and the other person just knows what the net? Right. So we, we do allow negative payments. And so, you know, where value can flow in the other direction. Um, and so, but the, the, the limitation, of course, is that it's still the, the customer that's initiating that payment. And so, the, you know, for the negative payments, the same proofs apply, the same conditions and everything that, that applies for a positive payment also applies for a negative payment. So from our view, you know, it's just a question of if there's like a, a refund that needs to take place, it's like the merchant just saying to the customer, hey, uh, can you initiate the refund of X amount? Okay. So yeah, so, uh, this makes sense. Uh, so it's almost still, we're sort of still keeping it as a one way channel, but we're just allowing for negative payments. And so that's kind of what we're kind of doing a pseudo bi-directional, I, I would call it in my head, helps me understand it a bit better. Now, the question is how, how do we make this, uh, payment now with through an intermediary? How do we, do we use like similar hash time lock style stuff that like lightning does, or is it a different uh, mechanism altogether there? We've been pursuing two paths, one with HTLC, which we know how to do, and then uh, one without. And, and so I'll just explain what it looks like without HTLC for now, in the sense that like, you know, I, I talk about like a phase one and a phase two type of thing where we're committing and revealing and then in addition to a proof um, to get a closing signature. Now, if if it's a, a one hop uh, type of payment, we do that first phase on both channels. Alice, you know, initiates the payment and then Bob does the same as well um, to Charlie. Um, and so at the end of initiating this payment, they both get a closing signature that reflects the updated you know, channel balances and the revoke phase happens after that atomically on both sides of the channel. And so if, if, you know, only the, the first leg uh, happens, you know, both Alice and Bob will be able to confirm that like, yes, I've received, you know, X amount, you know, without Charlie in the middle, you know, knowing about it. And so if Alice made a payment, but Bob hadn't at that point, um, they will both know. Um, and so because Charlie can identify their payments in the set of all of the uh, customers that, that are connected uh, to him, you know, Alice and Bob will be able to communicate to, to verify this. So I think this applies you know, to HDLC case as well as, you know, if we didn't have that available to us. Given that these channels are kind of special, that like as in that there are really one-way channels, can I use the same channel to go from Alice to Bob to Charlie and also use those same two channels to also go Charlie to Bob to Alice? Or is the uh, design of the that channel kind of one way and does the multi-hop channels matter who is the state holder we are assuming that alice is a state holder and bob is the state holder and and charlie is really just pseudonymous and you know he doesn't know the the, the current channel balances for either channels but the, because of the range proof they know that like that neither alice or bob are paying each other more than the capacity of uh that routing node does that make sense? Like it's, they, they'll never be able to, uh, cause I mean, Charlie won't, won't fulfill the payment if that proof isn't, uh, valid. And so the range proof is the only way to, to do that. So in other words, if, 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 it were, if some state transition re results in a negative balance for either side, like that 
that is bad, right? And so that is the case that we uh, make sure that our design and our proofs uh, address and that like one side can't magically get more money than they actually had in the channel, right? Because you can't settle. <laughs> so, or, or one side loses uh, some amount. Let's say in the single bi-directional channel case, if Alice is paying Bob or like Meher is paying Sunny, what are sort of the availability requirements on both sides? Do both parties need to be online? So, of course, the sending party needs to be online, but the receiving party also needs to be online because uh, there's this almost this interactive protocol where the sending party does something, the receiving party does something, and then the sending party has to do another thing. And then these, when these three steps are completed, then like a like a payment is made. And this extends to the hop case. So when Meher is paying IO via Sunny, all three parties will need to be online in order for both the jumps to be atomic. That's correct. And so, you know, while our proofs are not interactive, um, that like it, it's, it's verified without interaction, um, the payments are still interactive. And that's because the, the signatures that, that we settle with have to be you know, generated when, you know, when the proofs are checked. I personally think that makes for a bad user experience because in order to receive anything in in the in the bold case, but this applies to Lightning too, by the way. Yeah. Unless I, I mean they've they've changed their design, which I don't think. But it, it is it is a I do agree that it's it doesn't lead to a great user experience, but I think it is a inherent limitation of of the Lightning protocol. So Stark Pay, for example, is a solution that I believe removes that online requirement, but you know they. Uh, introduce other uh, limitations. So I don't. So I think it's really the use cases that will determine, you know, which approach you, you take. And, but feel free to correct uh, me in terms of the, the other uh, styles of protocols and how they get rid of the online requirements. I mean, the only main difference here is that I think in one-way channels, uh, if you don't use uh, Bolt, then you don't. The counterparty doesn't have to be online. But in, in any in almost every bi-directional channel implementation I know of, you always have to have both parties online. And even on things like Grin, for example, you need both parties online. I get this feeling that almost all privacy pre preserving things generally need to have uh, some <laughs> level of interactivity there. Yeah. Practical meaning of this interactivity is that then all users, so if, if the future is, you know, like privacy preserving off-chain payments, then all users start to need this always online node somewhere running somewhere in the house, plugged, plugged into their Wi-Fi, always observing payments that they're receiving. Well, to, to receive payments, yes. But like in terms of like protecting against fraud, I mean, you know, the watchtowers really help with that. Um, and that's something that we've been thinking about, you know, in the context of you have this asymmetry, like watchtowers don't work the same way anymore. And, and so what does that mean? And what does, this, does the, the new design look like for uh, watch, third-party watchtowers? And because uh, I think you know more users are con concerned about the fraud than like the fact that they need to be online to receive payments. Um, you know, just because the applications that they're going to be using anyways are going to be connected to the internet, right? Um, and so the other aspect is like outsourcing, like the non-custodial you know nodes, and and being able to do remote signing operations without you. Uh, having to run a lightning node you know, that's that's something else that that we think is also important so that gateway services that kind of you know so bit refill comes to mind and, and some of the other you know services that that offer like capacity as a service that offer you know all these different services for users to you know either receive frictionlessly or, or send um, without having to run a lightning node and i think you know those are the kind of use cases that i think what we're doing will, will help with just because um, it removes the need to trust that that service or that gateway. In Bolt, like in Lightning, there is symmetry between the sender and the receiver. In Bolt, there is not symmetry, right? So uh, the the sender sort of learning uh, running a lighter protocol than the than the receiver, right? I would say it's the other way. I mean, the the sender is running a, a heavier protocol than the receiver. The receiver is just verifying. Is the receiver protocol almost stateless, in fact, or is there some state? Yes. Well, it, it, the only state that they maintain is the um, revoked states of all of the channels that they have. Um, and so the, the thing is that they won't be able to identify which particular user those states map to or be able to link that. I mean, they can store it in a, in a, in a giant database and, or key value type database and, and just 
you know, observe who is doing what, but we're assuming that there is a network anonymity that, that is available to the user as well. So Tor would be the thing um, that we would, you know, kind of put um, a routing node behind um, so that like they wouldn't necessarily be able to, you know, watch for the same messages from the, you know, the same IP address type of thing. So it's the network anonymity and the transactional uh, anonymity that we would be providing. So give us a sense of like what base layer protocols Bolt can work with. It starts with Zcash, but where can it go to and what, what makes a good base layer protocol for integration with Bolt? Yeah, so um, like I said, Zcash uh, has been the, the reference implementation mainly because of uh, not only the shielded features, but you know, our ver the initial version requires a blind signature to be verified on chain. And so because of that, it's no longer a standard multi-sig. So one half of it is a you know st a standard signature. The other half is this blind signature that has to be verified in a special way. Well, not special way, but it has to be verified with a, an additional opcode. Zcash has been willing to make that change, and they've been gracious to you know um, support our vision uh, to have a, a private layer two. But other projects like Bitcoin, you know, that's not possible. We can't make changes to you know the base layer. You know, people have tried. Many have tried. Few have succeeded, and so for that, we've been looking at how do we just make a off-chain protocol that allows you know, you know zero knowledge proofs, uh, commitments, and actually producing commitment transactions that are similar to the blind signature case, but not using blind signatures. And so what we'd be using is multi-party computation. And so the the thing that that we need in that scenario is really is getting the counterparty to sign the commitment transactions in enlightening which are the things that you know get turned into closing transactions that get broadcasted allow us to produce those commitment transactions without the customer revealing the, the details of that transaction to the counterparty and so we, we still have the asymmetry but the commitment transaction would be formed using mpc versus blind signatures and so by doing it that way What's about verified on chain is still a standard signature uh, or standard multi-sig, but it's derived um, using MPC. And so, you know, the the only thing that the counterparty is is involved in is this, you know, interactive protocol to produce um, a valid uh, closing signature for that channel. But it's still doing the zero knowledge proof. It's still committing and, and all of that stuff. But it's just that this part. Um, where we're doing blind signatures, we're removing that and, and replacing it with an MPC, a very efficient MPC protocol. And so we've been doing a lot of benchmarks, understanding how far um, we can go with with this kind of implementation. And and so we're we're hoping to produce a paper uh, very soon with the with the design and the details of how this works. A lot of this revocation game and uh, challenge game, it does rely, or at least in Lightning, it relies on Bitcoin script. In Zcash, in the shielded pool, Z addresses don't have Bitcoin script. As far as I'm, I'm, at least back in Sprout, I don't know if it's chained in Sapling, but you couldn't even do multi-sigs or anything like that. How do I enter a Bolt payment channel from a shielded address? Yeah, so un unfortunately, the, the features that we need to build an end-to-end -end solution aren't there. And the best that we can do right now is funding the, the channel with shielded inputs but the output of that funding transaction is still visible. And so we're using the transparent features. So the aggregate balance for the channel is leaked to the network, and that's because of the transparent features. And subsequently, when the channel gets closed, you know, the, the final split is leaked to the network before you know, it, it goes back to the shielded pool. Um, and so it, while this is really just the first step, at least to, to work out the you know, the, the best thing that we can do. Uh, but like, we've been talking to them about like fixing transaction malleability, um, adding time locks, because that's, that's something that's also missing, relative time locks. And that's important for, you know, having this dispute period that isn't like a specific time, like it's relative to when closure happened. These features aren't available for transparent or shielded. And so trying to get it for transparent is the first step, and then getting it for shielded is the second step. And so we've kind of broken things down um, like that, so that we can, you know, build an end-to-end -end solution on on Zcash. For other chains, because, like I said, we don't necessarily want to um, have them make any change. So for Bitcoin, you know, everything that we're doing is just going to be off-chain, and the only thing that leaks is the fact that, like, 
you're funding this channel with some amount and, you know, with this particular party. Um, but like once you establish the channel, you know, all of the intermediate updates won't be linkable. We're looking at ways that, you know, we can leverage, you know, some uh, some privacy at base at the base layer for uh, Bitcoin, you know, in terms of like coin joins to try to obfuscate, you know, the identity of of the person funding a channel uh, from the network perspective. And so that's how we've been thinking about it, you know, for Ethereum and, and other like state channel implementations, you know, the adapting bolt um, is is quite straightforward. And, and we're working on, you know, a reimagining the, the protocol in, in the form of, you know, uh, states. And we've been thinking about it that way. It's just that the current instantiation is just focusing on payments, but it, it generalizes to a state as well. And so the, the first iteration, you know, we've been talking to a number of projects um, about, you know, potentially bringing Bolt to their platform. Um, and, and so, and, but we're kind of uh, prioritizing based on, you know, the, the size of the network that they're building, you know, the types of users that they think, you know, um, and then developers that will use it and the kind of use cases where privacy would, would be needed. Like we're, we're looking at all of those things uh, to determine which, which platform to, to deploy on first um, for state channels. But I think state channels kind of represents the bigger opportunity um, in the next uh, few years. Um, and so there's been some efforts to standardize, uh, you know, state channels from a number of the uh, companies that have been working on, on various implementations. And so we've been following that. And our goal is really to um, adapt Bolt to get into the standard, you know, so that like everyone can benefit from, you know, this privacy by default. Uh, or at least as a choice, and I think that's really what we're trying to trying to show that like if it's an option, you know, and it's available for people to use, then that's far better than you know it not being there at all, right? And so it's it's all incremental, and I think it's going to take you know um, time for us to get to the world where you know everything you know we have state channels that are private by default, but you know first step is really as an option, and then um, as it gains more usage, you know it'll make it a default. Is there any uh, interaction with the uh, any of the core Lightning teams? And like like you mentioned, this is actually um, complementary to the Onion routing that Lightning already has. And so, are there any like bolts? And well, I guess okay, we should get that actually out of the way. Where there's a little bit of a name collision <laughs> here, where yeah. the Lightning standard are also called bolts. We've apologized to them multiple times. <laughs> yeah, we, we're yeah. we're gonna fix that in the future uh, we've been and i i don't think i should throw out the the name we've been thinking just so that no one beats us to <laughs> it, but but we are hoping to uh you know change the the name of bolt um or at least what, what the protocol uh, is called um in the, in the near future are you guys working on any lightning bolts uh to like implement bolt privacy into the core lightning protocol that that is ultimately our goal um we haven't made any active uh, steps to that just because, you know, we want to deploy it first and then, um, you know, work with them to see how we can uh, make it part of the standard. Uh, but my my dream would be to have a Bolt, you know, spec um, that adds privacy as an option in the actual standard. Um, and our uh, implementation could be the reference, uh, you know, for that. And so that, that is really our goal. Um, and, and, you know, we're, we're working towards that. Now, in terms of interaction with the Lightning team, so Lao Lu is, is by far the, the the main person that that I've talked to in the past, um, and you know one person that I'm hoping to you know continue to kind of engage on on what we're doing and, and get his feedback. But like it's we're still early stage, so I mean we haven't really gone down that path yet. As a business, uh, Bolt Lab seems to have all of these options, which is you know like focus on Zcash, get the changes on Zcash, and build off-chain private payments on Zcash. That seems to be one. Second appears to be build off-chain payment solutions for Bitcoin using multi-party computation. So the third op option seems to be that integrate with the Lightning Network, right? Like get, get your changes in there. The fourth option should, seems to be that focus on something like Ethereum and try to get this into generalized state channels first and get like a trading use case or some other non-payment use case in with with privacy and i am assuming like by your description all four of these are different enough that you could not focus on all four in in parallel how, how do you decide what, what to focus on so uh, our focus really right now has been the the first two which is you know the so the the first variant with blind signatures that's already done 
the thing that we've been focusing on now, like, is the chain agnostic solution, how we can build that on, on say, Bitcoin. Um, and so those two are taking up, like, 95% of our time. The 5% is really focusing on, like, you know, the longer term, so six to, to nine months of what state channel implementations would look like. But we're using what we're, what we're doing now to learn what it could be for Ethereum. And, and the Connect Network is an example of, of a uh, project that we would love to, to work with just because, you know, they've built a, a generalized state channel. Um, and, you know, we've talked in the past with Arjun uh, Bhutani, um, who is uh, one of the founders. Um, and, and so they've, they've deployed um, and are interested in, in, in Bolt. And so we're, we're trying to figure out how we could support their efforts, essentially give them what they need to uh, integrate. But like, you know, we've, we've been focusing on just building the core protocol and the, the node around it. Um, and then once we achieve those core milestones, you know, a lot of the other things, you know, just fall into place. Working with Zcash has helped from a technical standpoint uh, to refine our solution understand you know the what what can and can't be done with the base layer in terms of the changes um, that would be necessary so th the short answer is like we're, we're focusing on the the core uh, protocol right now how will bold labs make money so assuming like you deploy it on zcash first and it works end to end people are able to make these private payments how does bold make money in this case so that is the question we've been um, you know exploring and, and understanding the market uh, for for bolt what we've come uh, down to is uh, focusing on the services the users and the products that they're gravitating towards uh, to determine you know what the best uh, entry point for us would be um, and so this touches on payments as well as uh, trading um, and so obviously for both cases you know the the way we make money is through transaction fees right but building those services or embedding ourselves in platforms that or networks that users are um, using would give us the, the, the best chance to, to monetize and, and, and capture the value that, that we're creating. Um, and so the, the general strategy is really um, on the transaction fees and, and going to where the users are uh, to provide you know, useful services that, that we make money from. So transaction fees means that? From each payment that they might make with the uh, a channel that they've established with um, with, either with us. So we could essentially run like a hub, essentially, to connect users to either exchanges or other uh, merchants. And so we essentially would be operating as a payment processor. And in that regard, you know, definitely, you know, the fees and, and our ability to have users of our own would give us the, the best chance to monetize. Uh, but when we plug into other uh, projects and, and work with, just as an example, like the Interledger protocol team. You know, so they've they've had a number of, of use cases in terms of cross border payments, um, and you know they've expressed interest in, in running connectors that support Bolt. That is a, an example of a of a network. You know, if it becomes really large, you know, we would be able to you know be part of that and collect uh, transaction fees as a result of you know, facil facilitating private cross border payments. Also, it appears to me that like Lightning nodes and Bolt nodes, like the one you are thinking of running, they are naturally like money transmitters. And they will be regulated entities rather than, I guess, anonymous participants running in this out of their basement. So perhaps that is what will provide a monetary model for, for the company. Yeah. So, I mean, we've been talking to our lawyers about, you know, the, the regulations coming out of FinCEN um, and, you know, other efforts to classify, you know, what layer two businesses would look like. Um, and so we're, we're watching those and understanding, you know, how we fit in, you know, but because we're, we're early stage, we haven't like tried to apply for one, for example. Um, but, you know, I can imagine that we might have to get one um, in the future to be able to do that. Th that's outside of my uh, wheelhouse. And uh, I defer, <laughs> defer to our lawyers in terms of that. Actually, that's, that's one of the things when you were explaining the privacy properties of the of the protocol, the, the thing that stands out to me is the one of the powerful pieces is if I'm paying you IO and you have a lot of channels open, you won't know which channel the payment came from. So if you have like, I don't know, a thousand users, payment came from somewhere, but you don't know which one of those thousand users gave you that payment, right? That's the, that's the superpower of the protocol when you are, when you are essentially a hub. 
from the other side if you are a money transmitter the government is going to force you to collect data about which one of those thousand users gave you the payment so it almost feels like one of the superpowers of your protocol is going to be challenged from the other side on this regulatory dimension and then there's an intrinsic tension between between these two things my thought uh, around that has been like the, you know if you think about the the channel establishment when you're setting up this relationship with the hub you know a lot of uh, KYC can be done. Um, I'm not saying that, you know, uh, I'm a fan of uh, that, you know, necessarily. But if we needed to satisfy the law, that is the best place to do the KYC. And then from once the channel has been established, you know, the the privacy properties and the zero knowledge proofs give the users protection against the the hub in the sense that, like, they can't track that information. And so if a request comes uh, from government regarding some particular user, the NC would know the identity of the users, but they wouldn't be able to link the payments to that user. And so it would be the user's responsibility to uh, essentially give the uh, information to prove that they didn't do the thing that they might be accused of. And so because they have the record, they have the state, they can produce proofs um, to satisfy various legal statements. You know, so for example, that I haven't paid uh, some third party um, with my channel. Right. I mean, that that given the way we've structured or designed uh, Bolt, that is something that we should be able to do. Um, and so that's what we're exploring in, in, in trying to kind of have um, you know, selective disclosure um, that the user controls. And so, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know how things will, will evolve in terms of, you know, the, the money transmission license being required. But I'm, my hope is that, you know, we can use their knowledge proofs as a tool to satisfy the law rather than just, you know, uh, being OK with hubs just having all of this information to be able to identify how we're spending our funds, you know, on a channel um, and, and all of the different use cases that that would be impacted by that being available to hubs by default. So what do you think are the uh, next, like, most important features? I mean, one thing I'm, I'm, I'm personally, you know, more, most interested in is how to expand from one, one hub to multi-hub, like multi-hop payments, because you know, if you want to build this into Lightning, that's kind of what's necessary. And, it, you know, I, I feel like the single hub system handles a lot of the censorship issues because of the privacy that we have now. But it doesn't help. We still have like, you know, liveness issues where if that hub goes down, then everyone, no one can make payments and stuff. So, yeah, I guess what are, what do you see as like the most important uh, things that you guys are going to be working on next? And like, you know, interoperability or, yeah, what, what, what do you see as the most important next steps? So, so by far, you know, building out the, the single uh, hop solution, you know, deploying that in testnet um, is, is the, you know, most important at this particular stage, in addition to agnostic design. Um, and, you know, once we are able to, you know, get that in the hands of users and developers and see and work on the, the usability of that, um, I think it'll give us more information um, about the future of, of privacy at layer two um, and, you know, what the, the barriers to entry would be, you know, both on the protocol side um, for other projects um, and also, you know, being able to show that, you know, the payments are going to be, are still efficient, but we're still preserving the privacy of the, of the user, giving them that control. Uh, my hope is really that we're able to, to prove um, that, you know, we can build a efficient and usable private layer two that you know, satisfies a bunch of use cases that people didn't know they had <laughs> or that they would you know, gravitate towards um, if privacy was, was there by default. Cool. It was great to catch up with you, Ayo. Likewise. Appreciate it for you guys having me. I look forward to the progress of uh, Bolt Labs. And once you have some products live and, and users, uh, look forward to having you back on the show. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll be excited to, to come back on, get your thoughts on on bolt as well that's it for the episode and we'll catch you next week thank you for joining us on this week's episode we release new episodes every week you can find and subscribe to the show on itunes spotify youtube soundcloud or wherever you listen to podcasts and if you have a google home or alexa device you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the epicenter podcast go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen and while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. 
If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week. Thank you.